Welcome back to Media 7, where I'm talking about how we train a new generation of journalists and how many we train with Ruth Zanker and Ed Mason. Uh, now, Ruth, before the break, uh, we were talking briefly about uh, social media and the internet, and there are so many issues there. <laughs> yes. one, well, one that fascinates me is that the time was when kids graduated from a course or got, went into a cadetship. It might be a year before they even got a byline on their mm, story. Now, if they go somewhere like Fairfax or, or mm. MediaWorks, they'll be expected to run their own Twitter feed from mm. day one without benefit of an editor. That, that's quite a big change, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a bit spooky too. Um, the earthquake in Christchurch um, by, it has been leapt upon by some of the Kania students as a tremendous opportunity to be both in a news story and as also reporting on the news story. And We had a, a student who went to an internship in Plains FM called Ed Swift and he went out and snapped some shots with Twitter and next minute he was he was the correspondent. The September earthquake. September. September yeah. uh, he was the correspondent yeah. on, um, on CNN and various other American networks and it was all very heady stuff. And um, then in um, the February earthquake um, another, another of our students, um, Cam Betts, uh, did the same and he was on um, America Today and various things th through Twitter. Um, and then interestingly on Monday I noticed on Facebook, because our school exists on Facebook at the moment, it's, lep it's dragged all the dinosaurs up into social me media in, in, in an instant, these earthquakes. Uh, we're all on Facebook. I noted the, noticed that there was Ed Swift, <laughs> who's now the online producer, producer yeah. uh, for News Talk ZB, and he was um, he was on Facebook saying, "Hey guys, give me leads. Tell me what pickies, anything you know." And he was getting all the students in the course to do it. Now that has, as you say, it's it's good side and it's dark side because you can make terrible um, blues. So what I'm doing in my course now is making them all blog the whole time. So the whole semester they've been blogging, but in a safe environment called Mahara, yeah. where we as tutors go back and say, hey, is that fact or opinion? Hey, where did you get that from? Hey, how can you prove that? And getting them to, um, to get into the awareness that blogging ha is a two-edged sword. And they've blogged on you extensively, Russell. Oh, how flattering. <laughs> I mean, th th this is, th this is uh, actually quite a, a crucial thing, isn't it? Th there's a wealth of information out there on the internet. Not all of it's good. Uh, is, is, I mean, is anyone teaching how to tell good information from bad? Which is, is we've seen seen some screw ups. I must mm. say, people people publishing headlines straight off Twitter and being wrong. Well, I think one of the biggest problems in in journalism generally is that we need grown ups working in it, and um, it's difficult to get people who've um, you know done. The, the minimum of training and then without a strong background in history, economics, sociology, a general interest in their society and how it works to um, actually make judgments. And so making judgments is, is exceptionally yeah. important. And what you were saying about, mm. the, about a safe environment for the students to blog in so that, they could, so that the tutors can check on it, that's a great teaching tool. Mm. It's a wonderful opportunity for these students to get the idea um, that um, just because it's there doesn't mean that it really qualifies as useful information to the reader viewer. And there are also, I presume, uh, ethical issues around what you take, say, from Facebook or from Twitter. You know, do you teach any well, of that? Well, if you look at some of the reporting on the earthquake, it's a terrible cut and paste. You know, there's, there's stuff where you can sort of track the same pictures and the same phrases right around the world and back again. Um, and sometimes people's privacy is breached as and, well. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. So yes, those are all critical issues and we debate them all the time as team, as a team and I was just talking to Joss today because was, I was sort of looking around some of the, the good material on uh, places like the Columbia Journalism Review and I've come across some really interesting new stuff that's being evolved for um, teaching um, ways of, uh, of, of ensuring that there is some degree of ethical framework around it and they're talking about how often with these communities that you get on blogs or through Twitter that you have the people who are the witnesses well how do you know they're the witnesses so you have to verify and you have to check that they are in the country they say they're and in this is and in the climate they're in or because whatever because you're, you're dealing with people that you can't see you can't face see to face. And, yeah. and, and then there'll be the people who amplify it 
yeah. and spread it everywhere without care. And then, and this is the interesting thing, there's another third group of people who are called the filters, and they're the nitpickers. They're your, 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 your traditional sub they're a, they're a <laughs> core part of internet culture. And it's um, so just, important. Just briefly, Ed, um, we've been talking about journalism in fairly elevated terms, but Ars Technica this week, I thought, had a very good uh, story on what it called the hamsterization of journalism otherwise known as journalism. <laughs> you know, basically people are turning around stories whether, they, whether the stories matter or not very quickly. It's almost a, a depressing thing to have to prepare kids for, isn't it? Well, I think a lot of people will decide that that's not what they want to do. Uh, that they may very well decide that I, you know, I have an interest in a particular area. Um, I've got this training that I got at a polytech or a university and maybe I'll just try and develop it myself. So maybe something that needs to be talked about at least is entrepreneurialism you know how yeah. am I going to get out and sell my stories and become part of this journalism community without necessarily working at a job that my contract says is a journalist. Journalists is entrepreneurs. Um. There is an interesting <laughs> site or two that are doing that like Story Storyville you know mm. that particular site and mm -hmm. there is some I think what we're going through is the extraordinary experimental phase of the digitizing of journalism and there's all sorts of things that'll die and others that will mm. flourish. Would it's you all agree? new and it's mm. changing mm. even yet. Ruth Sanker and Ed Mason, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Um, we'll head somewhere different now to Wairoa, where Jose Barbosa found a different kind of film festival. 60 kilometres south of Gisborne on State Highway 2, the traveller comes across Nuhaka in the Wairoa district. Sleepy is how a twatty travel writer would describe it, but as we often know, small places like this often hide awesome stuff. Nuhaka is no different. For the past five years, the Marae here has hosted the Wairoa Māori Film Festival. Held on Queen's Birthday weekend, it's a four-day event with film screenings, filmmaking workshops and kai. The idea was given to me by my auntie Pauline Tangiora. Uh, Pauline Tangiora is... Uh, uh, Kuya from out at Mungomai Wahine Mahia, and she'd been invited to attend a Indigenous film festival in France that was playing all Māori films at a town in France. And I said to her, gee, why doesn't someone do something like that here in Aotearoa? And so back in 2005, we had the first uh, white or Māori film festival, a uh, festival of Māori and Indigenous film from all over the world here in Wairo. It's not like any film festival I've ever been to. It's so low key and comfy, I was seriously considering pulling my hottie out and getting a bucky going. But the festival does what it does well. It isn't like uh, trying to move and shake your way up into an industry ladder. It's actually focused about meeting other creatives who are interested primarily in the art and the soul and the heart of filmmaking and really building strong bonds and strong connections uh, from that. It's really intimate, it's very close, it's very grounding, it's very community level. I feel like I'm surrounded by people that my story reaches. It's inspiring. It, it makes it worth it. It's a bit of a cultural and spiritual journey for me, like coming here from Wellington, who, um, you know, it's kind of a bit cut off from the marae and in the city and that kind of thing. And coming to the country here, it's, it's really inspiring. It's an opportunity to reflect on Māori filmmaking. Māori storytellers are very non-linear, but non-linear at a, a visual level. Definitely linear at an emotional level where the, nar where the narrative is um, occurring in a very straightforward arc, but that's at the bottom layer. But in terms of the way the memory is uh, recorded visually, definitely non-linear. Like, I prefer more of the Māori way of storytelling. While falling, he hears the voices of his loved ones, but he falls straight past them. He falls for so long, he drifts off to sleep. In the movie, it's, uh, even though it's in English, it's kind of like a very Māori way of telling stories with a lot of fantasy and, and uh, also, um, you know, animals and inanimate objects sort of playing a part and rather than the traditional um, yeah just linear beginning middle and end I like it sort of all coming from all over the place and coming together is sort of like being weaved like weaving a story. The festival also has its own awards and apparently a pretty awesome karaoke night which I'm sad to say we missed. 
So that's the Wairua Māori Film Festival, or at least for another year, and hopefully it becomes an even more important event on the filmmaking calendar. Because God knows the talent's out there, and it's crucial to have places that will hand us a mattress and just let us watch. Jose Barbosa there, and yes, he did have a good time. And that's our show for this week. Thanks again to Ruth Zanka and Ed Mason, and to you for watching. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye.